we record with much regret the death of Lord Avebury, which occurred early yesterday morning at his residence, Kingsgate Castle, near Ramsgate. It is hard today to understand the loss people felt in 1913 when reading of the death of Sir John Lubbock, the first Lord Avebury. For most of the 20th century, his achievements have been overshadowed by more rapid advances in education and welfare, in the preservation of ancient monuments and in scientific knowledge. But his contribution to the early improvements of all of these was to have immediate and lasting effect. Fewer have lived a fuller or busier life. The range of his energies was so wide and so conducive to the public good that he won a higher place in the estimation of his fellow citizens than many men of greater powers of mind. He was interested equally in the evolution of mankind and the ways and habits of insects, with which, in popular estimation, his name is closely associated. His work is bound up with a bill for public holidays, and it is needless for me to dilate upon the happiness this measure has given to millions of workers. John Lubbock was born in 1834 to a wealthy banking family. His parents held radical views on education, wanting their son's mind to develop naturally rather than be restricted by traditional teaching. Although John went to Eton, his father took him away when he was only 14 because of the demands of the family bank and the belief that he could get a better education at home to prepare him for a changing world. The Industrial Revolution had created sprawling cities filled with people unable to read or write, yet knowledge of the natural world was increasing in leaps and bounds. This was the time when Charles Darwin was putting the finishing touches to his theories of evolution and, quite by accident, he became a neighbour of the Lubbocks at Farnborough in Kent where the family had their country home, High Elms. The influence Darwin had on the young John was profound and stayed with him the rest of his life. This gentle, modest man managed to cram into his 79 years what most people would take many lifetimes to achieve. His own reading as a youth took nine hours a day in everything from geology to German. And it's fitting that his work in zoology was mostly devoted to the busy behavior of ants and bees. He began in the family bank at 15, and as well as making a major contribution to the efficiency of banking, he was made a fellow of the Royal Society at 23. He invented the terms Paleolithic and Neolithic, served 30 years as an MP, invented bank holidays, kept a pet wasp, became Vice-Chancellor of London University, though he never went to university, wrote best-selling books, saved the Avebury Stones for the nation, and became a peer of the realm. A busy man always finds time for everything he wants to do. And John Lubbock was always the busiest of men. How doth the banking busy bee improve the shining hours? By studying on bank holidays, strange insects and wild flowers. However, it was often said that if he had concentrated his efforts, he might have been more famous for less. There are now three short programmes for you to select. Sir John Lubbock's life and work are seen in the first years of the 20th century through the eyes of an anthropologist, someone who studies humankind, a working man, and a scientist. Watch all of them if you want, and in any order you like. What leaps in knowledge were happening in my time in the second half of the 19th century? The revolution was centered in Charles Darwin's home, high on the chalk of Kent. Less than three miles to the east was High Elms, the home of the Lubbock family. 
Like many prehistorians of his day, Lubbock was fascinated by faraway people, untouched by modern Western technology, and that by studying them, he would learn much about the primitive tribes of Europe long ago. He realized just how complex even the most apparently simple societies were, and that their customs and laws were linked to their ways of making a living. <laughs> this may sound obvious to you, but in our day it was all quite, quite new. But he was a bit of an armchair traveller, for though he read widely, he didn't go to see these people at first hand. And so he sometimes jumped to the wrong conclusion. But who can blame him? He had so much else to do. Yet he wasn't working blind, for friends brought him items from the tribes of Australia, Africa, the Pacific and the Americas. To compare with his own collection of European stone tools and pottery, he'd picked up on his early trips to the continent. Oh yes, he did go out to excavations, trowel in hand, in search of humans far beyond the earliest written records. Until then, there was only a rough reckoning of the periods, Stone Age, Bronze Age and Iron Age. But Lubbock saw that this was too simplistic when it came to the Stone Age, that there was a much longer, earlier period which he called the Paleolithic and a shorter, more recent one, the Neolithic. It was Neolithic people who began the great stone circle at Avebury in Wiltshire. But it was Victorian people who wanted to knock much of it down, to put up some houses. Sir John Lubbock used his wealth to buy the site, and thanks to him, what was left was preserved. When they made him a lord, he took Avebury as his title. Just by touching upon a subject, he could see things from a new angle and inspire others. He was a brilliant conciliator too. For if two pig-headed professors were at each other's throats, it was Lubbock who could persuade them that their interests were identical. Many a strife-torn, learned society wanted him for president, and he found time to be president of about 25 of them. Not bad for a man who never went to university. If you wish, you can now find out more about Sir John Lubbock's contribution to science and social reform. <sighs> what can I tell you of Sir John Lubbock? Well, from the point of view of us workers, it was better conditioned, see? A man in advance of his time. Until he come along, the only days off we had were Sundays, Christmas Day and Good Friday. But his Bank Holiday Act of 1871 gave us Boxing Day, Easter Monday, Whit Monday and the first Monday in August too. It made him very popular, as you can imagine. And the August holiday was known as St Lubbock's Day. Of course, he hoped we'd all get down to some self-improvement with books and such, and some of us did. But honest, are you going to sit indoors and read on a summer's afternoon? <laughs> and he did other things to help the likes of you and I. Those as worked in shops, for instance. It really was sweated labour. Many shops never closed, and the assistants slept under the counter when they got the chance. It took Sir John Lubbock 30 years of hard work in the end, he got the hours reduced, made sure shops had to close by eight, and told the owners to provide seats for the workers. He also had other great ambitions, to repay the national debt, to stop the destruction of ancient monuments, and to educate people in science. But if you are to get folk to want to learn, you've got to get their imaginations. And that's what he did. For 15 years, he was principal of the Working Men's College. But his books, he never talked down to us. And they sold by the hundred thousand, edition after edition, in every language under the blooming sun. Books 
which you could read to the children at bedtime, would at the same time be telling experts things even they didn't know. The books on botany, geology, archaeology, sociology, zoology. There was books on economics and books on scenery, books on the pleasures of life. He never forgot what he had heard, read or seen. And he always kept his sense of wonder. It was infectious. <laughs> if you wish, you can now find out more about Sir John Lubbock's contribution to science and archaeology. One day in 1841, when John was seven, his father said that he had a great surprise for him. Perhaps the lad thought it might be a present of that pony he had wanted. But no. Mr. Darwin is coming to live nearby. Oh, the disappointment. But the young Lubbock came quickly to understand what an important event in his life this news would be. From Charles Darwin, he acquired his love for science and truth and the patience necessary for scientific study. He took on board the great man's controversial theories that humans were descended from apes, that animals and plants were constantly adapting to the world around them and that nature, and not God, had chosen which species should thrive and which should perish. Sir John Lubbock became an evolutionist. And another thing about his work that was new, rather than just describing what he saw, he used experiments, test, trial and error. Whereas nearly all the natural sciences interested him at different times, his lifelong passions were plants and insects from childhood observations to a paper he delivered only months before he died. It was the intricate relationship, the interconnection between these two forms of life that set him thinking, investigating, experimenting. He took nothing for granted. He needed to know. He put everything under a microscope, constantly asking himself questions nobody else was asking. Why did seeds and fruits differ so greatly between species? What decided the shape of a tree leaf? Equally entrancing to him were ants and bees. He looked closely at their senses, taste, touch, hearing. How did they seek food and then find their way back to the nest or hive? How did they recognize a comrade or a stranger? He kept two ants to the ripe old ages of 14 and 15 years, and who were much mourned in the popular press when they died. Later in life, he turned more to geology, immersing himself in the scenery of Switzerland and Britain, pondering on how mountains were formed and how they influenced the way people made use of the land. His talent was to to connect ideas and, above all, to present science seriously and clearly to both experts and public alike. 